Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Boris Kramer. He will talk about listening transformations for dynamic system modeling and model reduction. Well, uh, thank you, thanks, Clep, and uh, thanks, Alexei, for the invitation. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking today about lifting transformations. Um, in general, about dynamic systems modeling, so how we can reuse lifting transformations to do rewriting of dynamical systems equations. And then we want to use them particularly for the task of model reduction. So this joint work with my postdoc advisor, Karen Wilcox, uh, and with a postdoc colleague, Alex Marquez, and Elizabeth Kwan, uh, who is a graduate student at MIT. Okay. I'll tell you a little bit about why we need reduced order models, um, what they are. Uh, I'll focus on nonlinear systems. In a second part, uh, introduce you to the projection framework that we use typically. Then I'll get to the core of the part uh, talk, which would be lifting and uh, POD, and then conclusions. So if at any point, I know some of this might be, uh, you know, if anything is new, if anything, uh, you know, you want to refresh or I should go a little bit slower or faster, if it's too boring, just let me know. Okay, we'll go uh, at the right pace. Don't have to go through all of this. So just my motivation. I want to give two, two three uh, ideas about why we do reduced order models and how they are important for us. So um, in a lot of these problems that come from a science or engineering background, you have very complex systems. Uh, this here would be, for example, um, a model of a rocket, for example, um, with uh, two thrusters. And you know you get a very complex coupling between uh, chemistry, physics, acoustics. You have different things like uh, turbochargers and uh, well, the actual uh, combustor itself. And a lot of things are interacting, and the systems are incredibly complex. Even at the, the smaller scale of just looking at one of these combustors, things are very complicated. The models itself are complicated, but some of the things of the model are not known. So some of the model forms might be not known. Certainly parameters can be f very hard to be fixed and pinpointed to like one value. So we do have to account for a lot of these applications and the, uh, to the uncertainties that we have in parameters and surrounding conditions or input conditions. Um, those are very important because some of these systems are actually prone to um, very sensitive to changes in parameters, and so we have to account for the fact that these parameters can change and they can affect the stability behavior of one of these systems. Um, so that's uncertainty quantification. In design, if I want to design any new product, oftentimes I have to explore a design space, different geometries, different configurations. If I want to do this, and, but the model that I'm running is a model that needs six weeks on the supercomputer, I have a very hard time doing a design exploration. So therefore, cheaper reduced, cheaper models are needed in order for at the early design stages of any product, especially in the, in the aerospace industry, where the flow physics are very complex and require high fidelities or require um, very detailed simulation. Uh, and then in control, control is a very different uh, topic in a sense, because control is the, in these first two areas, in design and uncertainty quantification, you can typically have a larger computational budget. You might have access to some larger computers, you can run them for a longer time. Design doesn't have, have to happen overnight. But control is something that needs to be very quick. Uh, if, you wanna, if you change your thermostat here, you want to feel more comfortable in a room in three or five minutes. Uh, if you change anything, if you, you, know, yeah, you, you push the brake in the car, you know, everything goes through a control system, you have right, it should happen in milliseconds. So in control, you actually the reason we want reduced order models in a control application is because the computational resources that are in the systems might be small. So you can't have a very large problem to, to execute. One of them that I've worked on before was control of uh, or air conditioning systems and how they would control thermal comfort in a room. This is a very recent application, so I'm not we, we haven't solved any of that yet, but it's the motivation for, for much of my work at the moment. So this is a current project that where we're looking at uh, ultimately getting to the part of getting fast models for some of these combustion simulations. So where people want to go, or where the sponsor wants to go, is to simulate one of these rocket engines where you would have fuel coming from the right, uh, well, ox oxidizer coming through these little tubes, um, called injectors, then you get fuel coming from the side, you get some reactions happening, and then you have the combustion chamber where a lot of the heat release happens. So ultimately, they want to simulate some of these, and they want to simulate them for different conditions, for long times, and long times for them are two, three, four seconds in real time, in order to see if the designs that they have are 
producing stable dynamics. Um, so right now that's, that's really hard to do and, and needs a lot of computational resources. And break the system down and say, well, just look at one case, one slight little engine configuration where you have um, same thing, but you just have one combustion chamber and then one nozzle outlet. So that's a case we're kind of trying to get at, at the moment. The problem is you have complicated physics and chemistry interacting with each other, and, and uh, the problem is hard to reduce in itself. It's a very complex problem, so it makes it hard to reduce, and you have to come up with some really uh, good methods which we're working on to make this feasible for reduced order modeling. Um, so challenges here are, again, chemistry, uh, physics, Multi-scale, things are happening in the fast and the slow time scales. If you have chemistry, you have uh, the flow. Um, a problem that actually one of our collaborators, are work, some of our collaborators are working on, Alex Marquez is another, my postal colleague who also works on this, is uh, of this system, or even of this system, you can't afford too many simulations at the fine scale or at the, at the fine resolution. So your problem becomes that you actually you you can't, uh, our reduced order modeling techniques often depend on data, but I, I can't get too much of this data because every simulation I run is very expensive. So even the training becomes a little bit of a problem and they're looking at different ways of training these models more efficient. Uh, and then one of the things we see that at the very core of the model, a, ROM should, a reduced order model or any model should give you a nice um, a prediction for a certain time of validity but when these systems become unstable, that's a really bad prediction because you, you blow up. So stability is the first thing we need to tackle and then we can go after accuracy. So that's a uh, few, few videos from our collaborators. So a few problems we see with reduced order models here is, for example, um, the input conditions can, can change. So uh, think of it like the engine and you have different uh, pressure profiles coming into the engine. And you have, for example, different forcing conditions of 10, 20, 30, and 40 percent from a from a certain baseline case. And for all of them, this uh, this is just a little bit of just visual, uh, you know, uh, inspection. You see that the flow fields look different. There's kind of different separations in the flow field. And but most importantly, what I want to show you in the bottom is this is a diagram that shows essentially how well can I produce a reduced order model with state-of-the-art techniques, and I'll tell you what state-of-the-art is in a second, here would be, I can reproduce this expensive simulation. Uh, this is the, the reconstruction error, and here we have the mode number. So how many in modes do I need? What's the dimensionality I need to reproduce something like this to a certain accuracy? It's actually really hard to see here. This is 10 to the minus two only. And so here we get for a low forcing condition, um, we kind of get stable models, but the the accuracy is still not too great. And then over here, our models, this is error 10 to the 1, so they're pretty much completely useless other than in a small range. You start extending that range a little bit, but you're still not too happy because what you want to see is that you keep adding modes and you get more accurate. Like the larger dimensional system should be a more accurate system. Oh, nice cool question. Yes. So to uh, abstract from concrete examples, mm -hmm. uh, suppose your uh, model is of the form x prime is equal to f of x and y. Mm -hmm. y prime is equal to g of x and y. Mm -hmm. by, uh, by an order reduction, do you mean find another model of the form x prime is equal to h of x, such that something holds? Is that the case? Yeah, I have a slide. Uh, I'll go through the, through the theory and the projection in a second. This is just motivation, but, but yeah, maybe it's clearer when I go through the mathematics of it, mm -hmm. if, if it's okay. We'll yeah, wait a few minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the other case we have here, uh, I mean, this is just different predictions. Training becomes a, a problem. So when we, um, we train a system, we collect data at a certain input condition, and then we try to use it when the system operates slightly off that condition, meaning somewhere between two and 8%, and we train the system at 4% forcing. And then what you see that for certain quantities, for example, this would be, let's pick this one, that you wanna reproduce the mean pressure, you see that your, your benchmark is the black, it's the, the, the CFD computation, and then you see that the other computations are totally off, um, which means that we do have to deal with the fact of how to train systems properly, and that we have to address the fact that 
when we actually have the reduced order model, it might see different input conditions. Um, uh, if I training, training. You mentioned training. Yes, it's going. There's, there's going to be a, a yeah. This is just kind of like the overall setting the stage, and then we'll have a a, a, a few examples certainly. So the big question for us is, uh, I want to get robust, stable, and efficient reduced order models for these strongly nonlinear systems. And there's some questions associated that, that we want to address long term. How can we deal with inputs and training? And that will become clear in the next slide, hopefully. Um, computational inefficiencies are there that we have to address. Uh, and then stability, I think, is a, is a, has been pointed out as a, as a main problem in these areas. So now we get into how do we get these models. Sorry, I skipped that part. Um, to do a little bit of justice to the field, there's a lot of different methods. I'll focus on one today. Um, but for nonlinear reduced order models, if you have a high dimensional problem, think of a finite element discretization, a computational code, you want to reduce it, a system is nonlinear, there's a few methods out there. Kind of the, the, the bell cow at the moment is proper orthogonal decomposition, it's been around since the 60s, and um, that has really given us a lot of good results and a lot of simulation and control studies. Um, but there's also inherent limitations of, of the problem that. Uh, of the method or of the reducibility itself. It's dynamic mode decomposition, which is, I would call a fully data-driven method. You only give it data from simulations and you come up with a dynamical system that matches the data in some sense. And then there's two methods that I was actually explaining a little bit before. Um, those are methods that I'm pretty interested in, uh, which is called balanced truncation and inter interpolatory model reduction. And those look at the dynamical system from a little bit of a different perspective. Proper orthogonal decomposition looks at x dot is f of x. x is very large dimensional. And it tries to approximate the state very well. Uh, these models uh, are models that are forced with an input. So it's x dot is f of x plus u. u is an input condition. And they're looking at an output equation. They're only interested in say the temperature over here, they're not interested in reconstructing the entire flow in the room, but they're only interested in the output. So there's an input-output mapping that they're really interested in these, and they're try these methods are trying to find the right models and the right modes um, to match this input-output condition and preserve some properties. And there's been a lot of work, I think, in the last 20, 30 years in model reduction, uh, but some reason work makes us really interested in these models because um, we can now do this input uh, output model reduction for quadratic systems and that's going to be part of the motivation why I do this. So I'll tell you how we get these and how training comes in and how we reduce things. So these would be our equations. Uh, so I don't have a second differential equation. So this is my state equation. This would be my output equation. Uh, X is a state. P is my parameters for now. U would be an input vector. Y is the output. Um, I approximate. So now I take everything here is in finite dimensions now. Uh, everything would be in n dimensions. So I take a basis V and I approximate my state in an in a r-dimensional subspace uh, of vectors. Okay? And then xr are my coefficients. So now I can, when I do this, I can uh, plug it into my system and I can compute the residual. Uh, so I get the residual equation and what I want to do, I want to enforce orthogonality of the residual um, to another basis. Oftentimes this is actually the same basis, a w is v. For, for the rest of the talk, W will be V. And then I get a reduced order model that is X dot of R, so dynamic equation for my R coefficients. This is a small vector, and that depends on the right-hand side, but the problem here is still, it depends on F of V of X, R, which means I still have to evaluate my full right-hand side. Why is that a problem? So I go from here, I haven't told you how to get V yet, so let's just assume we have V. Um, I go from here, I, I set V and W the same, so I get this projection. But now the cost of evaluating this right-hand side still scales with the full dimension because V is still my, my full vector that I have. Okay? Um, and so now I have to do something about this, and what you can do about this is you do some sort of an approximation or an interpolation. Um, and you can interpolate this right-hand side uh, by doing a couple of things. Uh, empirical interpolation, discrete empirical interpolation, uh, you can do missing point estimation, uh, the net method from, from Kevin Kahlberg. You can do many things on the right-hand side to make this part 
more computationally efficient than having to go back to the full dimension. And there's much research going on at the moment. Actually, Benjamin does a lot of research in the dime method here of how you make this approximation and where you make the approximation, like where the select side of the points and so forth. Uh, I'm still yes. trying to catch the definition. So what's the definition of ROM? A reduced order model? Yes, yeah, so how do you define it? This is a reduced order model. It's a, it's a model of reduced dimension. <laughs> that's, that's as simple as it is. A model of reduced dimension that approximates the state, uh, where do I have my state equation here? That's my approximation. It's a, this is a full order model, this is my reduced order model. So it only has R components, um, so it's computationally more efficient once I've taken care of this. And it approximates my full state. And how well you approximate this, this depends on which method you want to use. So if you write, I to write a definition, so you say for every V, this yeah. is a reduced order model. So V is anything, you can, you're free to choose the V. Yeah. yeah. So for, for every V, this will be called the reduced order model. Exactly. Okay. Now it can be, I mean, there's still a good and a bad reduced order model. You can choose a terrible V and your reduced order model doesn't predict the full dimensional X in any sense, right? So then you talk about accuracy. You say, how accurate does my reduced order model have to be? And then you give bounds on how accurate X is approximated by VXR. That would be a, you say, a re, that's an accurate reduced order model, yeah. So what are the properties that, um, that the reduced model must preserve? It's another very good question. So getting a, re, this is a reduced order model. So now you can ask about what are properties you want to preserve. If you're interested in mainly preserving accuracy, proper orthogonal decomposition is a method that people use. If you want to preserve stability, you might have to use a different method. If you want to preserve something that uh, Kleb has talked about, observability, if you want to keep the states observable, then you use something like, um, where is it here? Balanced truncation. Uh, controllability and observability are preserved here. There's quantities like passivity you can preserve. It really depends. Reduced order modeling starts at the very core question of what do I want, why do I want the reduced model? Why do I want to throw information away? Why and how much information can I throw away? Uh, if, I need an if I need an extremely accurate, probably a reduced order model is not the right way to go. You throw something away. Um, but once you answer the question, what do you need it for? Do I need it for a control application? Do I need it for long-term prediction, for a design study, for some sort of a design exploration? Then you can talk about which method you want to use, I would say, yeah. Would the goal of that production be mainly just get rid of some of the variables or not? Um, you could. I mean, our reduction is mostly a. I mean, a lot of this is projection based. So you have a finite element system. You have a PDE. You discretize in finite elements. Now, finite elements are very. A finite element basis function knows nothing about your system, right? So the simplest finite element basis function is the head function, right? It knows nothing about your system. It's a generic basis that you use, and it's a local basis. So you discretize your model with a million of these finite element basis functions, right? Um, then you simulate the system, and you look at solutions of the system, trajectories, and you notice, actually, that solutions live on a very small dimensional subspace, right? For example, if the system converges to an attractor, then you see you have low dimensional behavior. And then you make a switch of bases. So then you go, oh, just to raise the really quick. Quick. And then you say, we're going from here to a, mostly you go to a global mode, so this would be the finite element method. And then you go to something, this is just a 1D example, you say, okay, now we're going to a global mode. If I use a few of those, they have different shapes, you know, one can have, this could be the first mode, and this is the second mode. If I use 10 of those modes, uh, then I can approximate my system up to a certain accuracy. People have done that, you can approximate in different bases, and the basis we get comes from data in general. Or it can come from the matrices, I mean, it depends on what you're doing. But so that's where the reduction comes in. We use a basis that knows something about the system, whereas finite element doesn't know anything about the system, right? You have beautiful convergence guarantee, but you're not getting a low order model. Like getting a 10 dimensional finite element model is not accurate. Yeah. 
roughly speaking, to get the idea. Did that answer some of it? <laughs> should we? Should we? Yeah, let's continue. Let, let's see. Uh, okay. All right. So I think that's where I was at. Um, so now you want to do, you want to approximate your right-hand side. You want to get a more efficient evaluation of your right-hand side so that you reduce model. The main part is it needs to be faster to evaluate. Um, and the way you would be, actually, did I skip over the, oh, I didn't. So the, the parameters are now absorbed into X, is that correct? Uh, so you, you X are your state variables. So you had a P before, right? Parameters. Yes. So now it's like uh, X. No, that's just a typo. I just left the parameters out now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I just started. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that, that, that's my fault. Um, I started here from a very general case, right. and then I dropped parameters for some strange reason. So P should be out. All right. The dish could be instilled, but then it becomes another level of approximation. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Good question. Sorry about this. Um, okay. And this will be a detail. I don't want to go too much into it. But the way you can approximate this right-hand side is by uh, sampling the right-hand side at certain, um, at certain trajectories. So you, you sample the right-hand side, your, your F, at solutions that you've already computed of this. So you solve the system, you get X, you compute snapshots of F of X, you do a POD on this one, and then there's a way to approximate this right-hand side. Okay? And the way I want to just maybe focus on the bigger picture, the way to do that um, there's, there's a method that gets you this, it's called discrete empirical interpolation, and it would give you a selection operator, P, that says only evaluate this F term at a few points. Um, some of the challenges we've seen here, there's very different ways of addressing these challenges, is that when you do the standard methods, um, state of the art at the moment, um, you see that you need a lot of interpolation points, meaning your, compute, your reduced order model has only R states, but it's still very expensive to compute. And uh, the more approximations you introduce, so now you approximate this right-hand side with another term, the more approximations you introduce, maybe you're losing some of the, it becomes diffi more difficult to analyze a right-hand side. Okay, and now I'll skip over this a little bit uh, because those are details about reduced order modeling. So now I wanna show you what, um, what we'll be focusing on in this talk. So the linear model, the way we write down a linear model typically is like you have a mass matrix, you have in your, your states, you have a linear uh, part, which would be discretization, say of a diffusion, for example, a convection uh, A, and then you have your linear input, uh, and you would write a reduced order model that has the same form, and once you have these V matrices, um, you can project essentially your system matrix, your input matrix, and your mass matrix. So everything is projected and this is easy to compute. Quadratic model on the right hand side, we write it, I mean this is just a notation, you can, you can pick how you want to write a quadratic model. Uh, here it's written uh, as a kind of matricized tensor H and then you have a Kronecker product between uh, the, the, your state. Um, and the nice, the beauty about these quadratic models is, and actually about any polynomial model, is that you can still pre-compute the right-hand side. So if you do a Galerkin projection, it's a nice property about the Kronecker product that you can use. You still get an H hat that can be pre-computed once you have your basis. And once you have your, you have your H, you have your basis, you can pre-compute this. And so the right-hand side, this automatically depends only on X hat and not on anything else. There's no, nothing of, uh, you don't have to go back up to the full dimension. Which also means I don't have to introduce an extra interpolation to deal with the right hand side. And then and that's essentially how we we compute these models. I just wanna wanna drive it home. Now you can add a bilinear term. Sometimes it happens that the state interacts with the input. Um, this is called bi it's bilinear in state and input. And uh, if you have a model like this, which we will get later in the talk, then you can do the same thing. You can pre-compute any everything and you have a nice reduced order model. So question now becomes what is a good V to choose, right? And you can do the same for polynomial systems, but I don't want to get too much into this. And so, last point here is that we can do this, this model reduction very, very nicely for a quadratic system. And that's why in the next part of the talk, I want to show you this uh, lifting uh, method, which can take a general nonlinear problem and write it as a quadratic problem. 
And the reason we do this, the reason we're doing this, the reason we're blowing up a dimension is because quadratic problems we can very well reduce. Like that's the motivation behind it. So if you, so let's go to lifting. Uh, we're trying to, and I think you're doing something similar, maybe the, the other direction uh, with eliminating variables. We're kind of adding variables. <laughs> so, so in a sense, bear with me. Uh, and there's a reason we're doing this. It becomes simpler. Huh? It becomes simpler, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes simpler to reduce. Yeah. So, um, so what we want to do, we have a general system uh, with a general right-hand side. Um, and I want to write this system with original coordinates x tilde into a new system where I have different coordinates now x, uh, but the right-hand side will be polynomial. And let's just assume it's polynomial on x and we still have a linear input. And my new state now contains the old state, but a bunch of added states that depend on my old state, x tilde, okay? And I have to add L of these, and I don't know what L is. That's an open question, okay? Um, and that's something I'd really, you know, if you have any thoughts on this, uh, we'll, we'll see in a, a couple of slides, maybe we can talk about this again. Like, what's, what's a, the best, What's the best transformation that takes a general nonlinear system into a quadratic system? And is there a minimal lifting transformation? That's the question we're very, very interested in if we can find a solution. Do you want so, a minimal one? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I would like to think a minimal one is good because then you keep your lifted dimensional in check because at the lifted dimensional you have to do reduction. And reduction. Don't you, don't you want that one that you can reduce the most? Yeah, so I want it in quadratic form, but there might be very many forms that make it quadratic, not just one. And if there's many different ways to make it quadratic, I want the one that has the lowest dimension. Okay, we can maybe we can. It. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Because I thought you want the reduced dimension to be the lowest. So you yes, want that's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, the reason I'm thinking right now that I would want the lowest one is because any model reduction in the in that dimension where x dot lives will typically when I do balancing or something will scale with n cubed. Uh, okay. So I don't want to add too many states and then I run see. into the curse. I see. So right now it might not be connected to your reduced. Exactly how I reduced it. Okay. But there might be, yeah, you're right. Yeah. A lot of open questions you'll notice. <laughs> um, so this is something we started about a year ago and I think we're, we're still trying to get to the, to the bottom of some of the things. Uh, anyways, I'm trying to convince you that, uh, and, and you know that, that a lot of general models can be rewritten as uh, quadratic models. And therefore, when I speak of quadratic models and model reduction for quadratic models, I actually speak of a way larger class by the virtue of the lifting. And okay. you have to consider how the quadratic uh, reduction reflects the original, the properties of the original system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. All things we still have to study. <laughs> I'll give you a few answers in this talk, but not, not, uh, not all of them yet. Um, but then we think that a quadratic system is uh, easier to study than a general nonlinear system uh, from a stability perspective, accuracy, preserving properties, and so forth. All right, simple equation. And like I said, this is now going exactly the opposite of what I, what I mentioned to you earlier. I have this system, so I have x that is x to the 4, everything is 1D, and I have one input condition, so u of t. Uh, what I want to make, I want to make the system quadratic. So it's a simple exercise. I pick a new variable, w1, it's x squared. I take, pick a second variable, w2 is w1 squared. Uh, I have to add a dynamic, so in the first step, the way I do first, I show you how to add a dynamic equation. So I take the derivative of this one, call it lead derivative. So you get uh, 2x x dot, plug in x dot what you had before. Well, uh, w1 squared was w2, so you, you write it out, and you have your uh, first, I call it auxiliary dynamics. Do the same with w2. Uh, you can do it, you write it out. Problem is you still notice that your new state now contains x, w1, and w2. So you still have a cubic system. Now you introduce one more variable, you introduce x, w1. You do w3 dot. Well. You can, you can work it out. And you actually notice that everything now is there's a bilinear interaction between my new state and my input. But then I have quadratic terms. Uh, so I can now say, okay, so I wrote this system of order four, which I didn't um, 
later on everything will be higher dimensional. There's a 1D problem. So I wrote it in a system with four different uh, three auxiliary variables, but the system is quadratic, and the quadratic system I, I, I know how to reduce. Okay, and I think Gleb, if I understood you correctly, you would go from here to there. That's right. Trying to, you, with the algorithm, trying to eliminate some of the variables that we don't. That's need, correct. Right? Yes, that's what we discussed. Okay, um, but then you can also go the other way, and you can say, oh, I I don't even need to add all these extra variables. I can just encode my first. Uh, property in an algebraic equation, right? And then you have a differential algebraic equation of, of uh, you know, with two dimensions essentially. Okay, so that's the idea, and that's um, like I said, probably a different way of thinking about this problem. Now, variable transformations have been around for a while uh, in very different communities with very different goals. Uh, one of them was McCormick, kind of start. I, I probably. And if I get any other references, so if you know of any other references before that, please let me know. Um, in, to solve non-convex optimization problems, McCormick was one of the first ones to look and find a new set of variables in which he could actually, I think, uh, transform them to, to a convex form. Feedback linearization has been looking at this since the 80s. Uh, Kerner has come up with a nice method in, in 81 to transform general ODEs to a certain form, uh, he calls it a Riccati form, which is purely quadratic. And then there's some other canonical um, representations of, of systems. They are higher order polynomial systems, but they are very interested in, in uh, biological uh, applications. And then one of the methods in model reduction uh, that's been used over the last maybe uh, five to ten years is called uh, dynamic mode decompositions, and underlying is something that's called a Koopman operator. So what the Koopman idea is, it takes, it says I have a finite dimensional system and I write it, if I know what my correct observables of the system are, as an infinite dimensional system. And then the infinite dimensional system, I want to approximate um, part of the spectrum of that operator. It's a pretty, pretty nice idea, but um, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of related. You, you rewrite your system, you're trying to find a different representation, and then you can do some reduction. Um, the one we're most interested in is that that came out uh, of this goo paper in 2011 where uh, paper says you can lift many of these dynamical systems to um, this QB form, which I've shown you before, quadratic bilinear form. And then uh, he was actually, he did, a, I think, a one-sided model reduction for, for these problems. And the um, reason we're so interested is because we've seen a lot of effort in the last two years now uh, that these QB systems are very nice to reduce. Um, so I'll show you a few examples now um, of the lifting, how we re rewrite certain problems, and I can skip some of the problems. I don't have to go into all of these. Uh, they're just trying to to kind of get to the get to the idea. So this would be a Fitzhugh Nagamu model. Um, it's a model of a spiking neuron. This is used very often in our community. It's a, it's a bench kind of a benchmark model. So one of the things you look at the differential equation here at the PDE. See the only thing that bothers you if you care about quadratics is this cubic term. And so then you introduce one more variable, which uh, z is v squared. You do the c dot trick, essentially. So that you compute c dot, uh, which is 2v v dot. And then you plug in a few things, and then you get one auxiliary variable that you picked up. Uh, you also have to think about boundary conditions. Um, so you have to prescribe boundary conditions that are consistent for z as well. And you can derive them from your original uh, variable transformations. So essentially you can, I'll show you some numerical computations later. I, I will have taken this model, and then a finite element, I will do this model and then a finite element and we'll reduce both of them. And then I, I show you uh, some results that they're, they, they match fairly well. Um, however, with this model, it's quadratic. Uh, I can use a lot, I can use a lot more model reduction techniques than I can use on this one. Then something that's, that I only came across once I uh, um, got into an aerospace department, I've never seen that in, in, a, in a math department, is the Euler equations. Um, so the Euler equations are um, essentially you, you prescribe uh, three equations in the, in the conserv they call the conservatives of variables. Um, um, so you have rho, rho u, and, and uh, e, which is the energy. And then you have this constitutive relationship here. And so essentially, there's two ways of writing the system. You can write it also in what's called the primitive variables. 
And if you make this variable transformation, want to write it in rho u and p, so density, velocity, and uh, pressure, then the system is actually nice. Uh, the only term that kind of bothers you is this one over rho, which is, of course, a nonlinear function that, that you don't want to necessarily, that, you know, from a model reduction perspective, we'd like to bring that in the quadratic form. So Elizabeth, a um, student that was on the, uh, mentioned at the beginning, so she looked at this, she said, okay, we can do, we introduce one additional variable, one over rho. Uh, we know density is always positive uh, in, this, in this flow. So, I mean, general here, and then we take the derivative, we do the same trick, and actually you can prescribe an ex extra variable now for uh, dq over dt, which is quadratic. So now you made, you went from, from this formulation, you plug in the q here, add one extra equation, and you have brought your system into a quadratic form. And the quadratic form, again, can't say it often enough, um, now I can do reduced order modeling here on this, on this problem. So I went first up in dimensions, and then I'm going down in dimensions. So it, is this kind of transformation automatic? I mean, is there an algorithm that if I give you the system, it will come up with that, or do I have to just do it ad hoc? Yep, uh, you have to do it. Right now, it's me doing it. Okay. <laughs> um, that's another question. I mean, number one, can we figure out what's the best transformation, if it's minimal or if it should preserve certain properties, and how can we you know, automate it, essentially? And I think, symbolically speaking, I mean, this is a very good um, uh, point of contact, I think, that would be good to talk afterwards, yeah. Um, right. So right now, it's me, it's me or Elizabeth or someone else looking at the equations and saying, these are terms we don't like. It's probably your worst symbolic computation <laughs> example, right? Uh, saying like these are terms we don't like, and then uh, you know you, you you try to take. But again, non-uniqueness is another thing. I could have I could have chosen uh, two over row, right? Uh, or I can. In this example, I think there's probably an obvious one, but we have other examples where uh, that are much more complicated, where two people do it and come up with a different lifting transformation. That's it's not ideal. Um, all right, and then we have some uh, tubular reactor example. I think this one, I'm not gonna go too much into it. You can do a similar thing, so this would be a, uh, here you're prescribing, this is a very simplistic model of a, of a reactor, um, a 1D tubular reactor. Uh, you have psi being the species and theta being a temperature. You have a bunch of parameters. Essentially, you have a diffusive term, a convective term, and this is the term that you really don't like too much from uh, from, from maybe an analysis perspective, because you have the, the states multiplied against exponentials of the inverse state. And so this is a highly nonlinear function. And, and so the first try here was, you know, we'll, we'll take W1 to be this part. We need a few extra variables, which is actually another thing that kind of pops up here. Once you take derivatives, you need some extra variables at times to close the system, um, to make it, yeah, a close representation of its variables. Anyways, you, um, I don't want to go too much into the details of this, but essentially you just take these, you take your derivatives again, write it out. You end up still being quartic. So when you take these derivatives, your right-hand side is still a, a fourth polynomial order. Um, and your original equations, these two, uh, became quadratic now. So now we can say, and this is when we kind of stopped, so now you can say, okay, I, I can make it uh, quadratic if I introduce these four more variables. Uh, three, sorry, these three more variables, and then I make it a quadratic DAE. So now I literally just replace the um, the variables that that were in the quartic terms, and I encoded this in a DAE. The reason I did a DAE here is because when I kept differentiating these systems, so when I do W4 dot, I kept picking up a higher order again. And then you need to introduce another variable to kind of close the system, and this kind of started getting a little bit... Uh, probably out of control, uh, colloquially speaking. <laughs> so anyways, what I was trying to convince you here is that I can take this PD and I can write it as a DAE. And, and that's actually a thing you can do for, um, if, I think for uh, right-hand sides that you can take the derivatives off. Okay. But then, now you have the problem. So we took the system, we rewrote it, and this becomes a lifted QBDAE with a singular mass matrix, right? And for this, we don't really have very good model reduction methods yet. So ideally, if this is an ODE, and so if, if E is uh, invertible, 
then I can do a lot of the model reduction. But right now, this is kind of where we're stuck. I can't necessarily do the model reduction on the um, DAE part, or I, I can't necessarily deal with the quadratic um, DAE yet. So that's still an open problem uh, that we have to think about. I can deal with a quartic system. So if I leave everything here and I have um, a fourth order system, I can do POD for that. Okay. Again, reminder, we've had this slide before. I'm gonna show you again. I have the full order model. I did all this lifting at the PD level to bring things into quadratic form. And then I do reduction. And that's where this proper orthogonal decomposition comes in, which is a standard method for nonlinear model reduction. And so now we're going through a few results. Um, so for the Fitzhugh-Naguma model that I showed you before, I had uh, two state variables. I added a third one, which was a c equals v squared. Uh, so c equals v squared was my extra state. Um, here, of course, I, I show something maybe fairly tri trivial. You look at the singular value decomposition of the snapshot set. So the way you compute proper orthogonal decomposition is you solve the system at the high level, at, at the finite element system. Um, or whatever your discretization is. Solve the system, you collect the snapshots, and you do SVD. So at the SVD will give you, um, of course, the, the basis vectors, but it will also tell you how fast the singular values decay, which means how well you can approximate the solutions um, with a few vectors, right? And so of course what we see here is that Z and V squared, I mean, they have this redundant information that decays similar, uh, but then the second state decays a faster actually than the first state uh, B. So we have hoped that we can, so for example, with a mode 10 approximation, I can uh, approximate my second state W maybe up to 10 to the minus five, whereas I need, if I wanna go to 10 to the minus five, I need a few more states for, for C. Uh, okay, and on the right-hand side, we see two outputs of interest uh, that are point measurements of the states. One of them is here, you have a full order model, reduced order model, and the other one is here. And the full order model and the reduced order models uh, match perfectly. And that's what you want. You want a cheaper model that reproduces, in that case, your output fairly well. So, so that would be a good, for that case, a good reduced order model. Um, I'll go into that later, actually. Let's, let's move. I have a similar slide later, so that's some of the details. So, so here I have uh, the reduced order modeling for Euler. Uh, for the Euler system that I showed you, so at the system, general form, uh, there's actually no input. Um, and then on the right hand side, this was a lifted system. Then I did, did the, or this was actually Elizabeth, did the model reduction for a uh, 15 mode and a, and a 20 mode model. So the full order model will be, uh, I think, a finite difference approximation here, blue lines. And then the reduced order model is the red line. Start seeing as uh, time is running here, start seeing eventually a little bit of a deviation of the blue and the red line. If you add more modes, actually seem to track fairly well. Okay. Um, so so uh, with that speaking, this would be a, depending on what you need a reduced order model for, this would be a good, good model. Um, I don't have timing results here. I don't know how much faster one is over the other, but I think it's significant here. And then uh, here would be essentially a little bit more uh, you know, numerical. You, as you increase the basis size of your model, your model gets more expensive, but it also gets more accurate. So that's kind of the behavior I want to see. One of the first slides for the combustion problem, what we saw, is that it went down and then it shot up again. The models became unstable and the errors increased. But what you want to see is that as your model gets larger, you're getting more accurate. That's kind of the behavior you'd like to see, okay? And this is the mean relative state error here. So again, I think with uh, these 18 basis functions that um, were used here, you get up to a, a percent accurate. Uh, then this tubular reactor model that we've seen, um, so where the original system was again of this kind, I did the lifting, um, and then I simulated both systems, or I reduced both systems with, uh, with POD here. And then uh, you see here the full order model. This is for um, this uh, limit cycle oscillation, which is also uh, a point measurement. You kind of see this uh, nice limit cy cycle approaching. Full order model would be blue. The reduction that I've done in the quadratic form with POD would be red. 
track fairly well. And then on the right hand side would be a, a simple stable case where everything just goes and, and levels out. So pretty boring case probably. But, but Boris, may I ask about yes. this? So, so but you, you, you mentioned that you don't know how to reduce such model nicely, right? Yeah, so that's why there was so, a little trick. Ah, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so uh, this is all obtained by some special trick for this uh, DE? Right. Okay. Yes. So the way we did it here, um, so the way we did it here, you get a, you get a basis for your dynamic variables. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you get a basis for these five dynamic variables. You compute this basis. Actually, we compute separate bases for each of the quantities because there's some scaling issues that we haven't resolved yet. So this is a concentration. This is a temperature. These are something else that I don't. I mean, it's a mixture of everything, so I don't quite know what they are. And then I have these auxiliary variables, um, algebraic variables, I guess, call them. W4, W5, W6, for those I also take, uh, I approximate them as well. Mm -hmm. And once I've approximated them, I actually put them back in here. So I make it a quartic system again. Ah, and I, I simulate a quartic system. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the way I do it at the moment. Okay. And the next slide actually shows you how well you, and you might know a better version to do that, but depending on how well you approximate the algebraic part, the more accurate your system becomes, of course. But that, mm -hmm. that feels natural to me at least, um, which essentially means you solve the algebraic part on a subspace. Uh, so over here I show you, again, reduced model dimension. We want to increase the model and get more accurate. Again, here's the, comp the comparison of a full state and the state that's predicted from my reduced model. And then here, the best case you would ever do would be this POD method. Um, the POD method is okay, 10 to the minus 2, goes down to 10 to the minus 8. Very accurate method um, for this problem here, but again, it's very expensive. And this goes back to one of the first slides I showed you where I said, well, on the right-hand side, you have to do some sort of interpolation to make the model faster. So the regular POD would be too expensive, especially for lar larger model dimensions. So then you do dime. Um, discrete empirical interpolation, you approximate the right-hand side. If you do this, you have to choose how well you want to approximate, how many interpolation points you want to choose. I gave you two. Those are, might not be the ones that I choose for the final model, but those are two different ones. So the, I choose 10 points and 20 points here. Eventually, this is just to illustrate what can happen with this model, is that as you approximate the nonlinearity only at, you do an interpolation at essentially 10 locations, um, what happens is that your interpolation error essentially dominates and you, you can't get more accurate by adding modes because you're already making a lot of errors on the nonlinearity. Of course, you can make that more accurate and then it gets more expensive, but you can do that and then you get better in error. And with our method, of course, since we don't have an extra interpolation or an extra approximation on the right-hand side, the quartic me method doesn't really have this problem. Um, so we kind of get this convergence. We start slower. We start at a higher error, but we, we kind of mm -hmm. don't level out, essentially. And then this would be this, when I project here, when I say I, I use a subspace for these two, so I can either keep them exact, or I can project them into a subspace. When I use a subspace, I also lose accuracy. This would be the error case here. And then depending on how, I how well I approximate uh, my algebraic uh, equations, then I kind of get this leveling out, uh, which is something that we've just observed here. Anyways, I mean, the better methods for model reduction of algebraic, differential algebraic equations are still uh, needed. Right now, there's good methods for the linear case, when you have a linear system, and for the uh, bilinear case, when you have, uh, let's go back. So if you don't have the H, it's okay. If B is singular, you can do it with A and with this part, but there's not a good method right now, or not much that I'm aware of when um, that, that quadratic part is present. So that's why we did it like that. All right, and then some conclusions, and that's probably yeah, where... You... Yes, yeah, yeah. One more question. How do you... Um, can you pre-compute this algebraic part? Or do you have to do it in each time each iteration? Each time step, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you... Okay, so you decompose the time step and you mm -hmm. first solve yep. for the algebraic part. First solve for the algebraic part, part and put it and back. And then you go... Okay, but that sounds like a reasonable approach anyway. That's what I think, but you can also have you know time steppers for DAEs, and you don't have to deal with it. I mean, you don't have to do this too.
but that's how I do I it, and that's what I thought. It's it's really good anyway. All right, and then um, any other questions or well, let's 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 go to the conclusions. There's definitely some questions here. Um, we think that the lifting, actually going the exact opposite direction than, than I feel uh, you've been going at, uh, has helped us in the model reduction. And uh, especially for some of the PDEs that we've looked here that are of interest in this combustion applications, we can do the lifting. And I didn't show you the most ugly result, but there's a very uh, a much more realistic simulation that, that uh, people use, uh, some of our collaborators use for these combustion simulations. We came up for a for lifted system as well, which is, I mean, we still have to implement it. That's a, that's a very tricky part. Um, but the thing is, when we do the lifting, we have to, we will get to the point that if we don't want to keep increasing space dimensions, we have to deal with the AEs. And the question is, how do we deal with these AEs? I think in the model reduction community, we don't fully know that yet. Um, the structure, I think, that we get by going to this lifted uh, system really gives us hope to do input independence. And that is very important for, for control applications or think of it like an application, as I mentioned at the beginning of a combustor, where the input always varies. So if you only compute the data from one input condition, but your input keeps varying, then there's not much hope that your reduced order model would be good across order of input conditions. So, so these are some really, um, hopefully a promising avenue that we can get something going there. Uh, currently, I work on stability analysis, um, which becomes much easier when the system is quadratic. Um, you still have to do yeah, enough uh, functions, but you probably know how to choose them. And then this is something that Elizabeth is working on and, and uh, that we're also very enthusiastic about is when you now step away from the, from the PDE world, for, from the intrusive world, everything I've shown you here, I had a a MATLAB code in that case. For each of the models I had a MATLAB code and I did a projection and then I could, you know, time step my, my reduced code again. Okay. If I don't have the code but I have the I have the governing equations. So then oftentimes um, if you don't have the code you want to do something that's called learning, right? I mean the general realm of learning in our community it's kind of called data driven model reduction. So you want to use the data and learn a reduced order model directly, kind of sidestepping the, the code or the, the discretization that you have. And we kind of think of it as a hybrid way. If you learn a general, it's pretty hard to learn a general system, x dot is f of x. If you have data of x, how, how to figure out what f of x would be really hard. And there's you know, certain frameworks, but you know all of them make certain assumptions. But if we know, say I measure data of x, and I might not have the simulation code or it's a legacy code or something that NASA works with and we can't touch, but I have an experiment or I have a code and I know those are the governing equations, right? Then I can do what I did here. I write down equations that make the form quadratic. Then I have my new equations, my new vector x, which was x tilde w1 of x tilde w2 new variables. I measure those. And in this representation, all I have to learn is a quadratic system. So then I have to learn quadratics, which is easier to do than learning, finding a right-hand side. Because I know the right-hand side will be quadratic in that case. So that's something that Elizabeth is looking at. And for two examples, she has some uh, promising results, I think. Um, again, I mean, open questions would be here. The model reduction of DAE systems. Um, basis representation, we're still thinking about if there would be maybe some different approaches to finding a basis for our lifted system and can elaborate more if that's if that's of interest and then finding the right lifting transformation or the right one um, ideally I mean the wish would be an algorithm where I say I want to preserve stability give me a lifting transformation or <laughs> let's put out a wish you know it's Christmas soon right uh, <laughs> or you know give me the minimal transformation that will do the job if I'm after a mid the uh, smallest one so won't likely answer all of that right now, but this is something where we need to think about what would be good variable transformations that give us structure in the system that we can exploit. And um, preliminary results are up here. And then I want to thank everyone. Questions? So 
it appears that, um, that any dynamic system can be reduced to a quadratic one. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, if you just allow yourself to keep adding variables. Yes, yeah. I mean, unless there's there's non-differentiable terms on the right hand side. So, for example, if you have think of like a gamma function, sure. okay. you can't do that. Then you can't do that, <laughs> right? But and that was shown in that GU paper, two thousand eleven, that you can essentially write if you have these differentiable right hand sides, mm -hmm. and you can take these linear derivatives, then you can write it. So, um, in the lifting steps, have you consider, let's say, you using dimensional analysis to get some accurate variables and for the substitution? Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on this, because we have... Um, I mean, for for a biological system, and sometimes these, uh, what, do I, what do they call that, the stereo, I mean, about the chemical equations? Stoichiometric. Stoichiometric, right. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually get some aggregate variable that controls the behavior of the system. Mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. So could those be good candidates for your substitution, your new variables? Um, I think so, but I, it feels to me that, that what you're saying um, kind of goes a similar direction. It's also stoichiometrics, you, you right. kind of know something, right? Right. And, sure. and that information you're using right. to get you the variables. Right. In a sense, that's what I'm doing too. I look at the system, I kind of know which one are the, the terms I right. don't want to have, right? Yeah. And I rewrite it exactly. Um, uh, no, but, but, uh, but at least in stoichiometry, uh, you, you, have, you, you need to do a little dimensional analysis right. to come up with those variables, right? Yeah, we haven't right. done that yet. No. And so would it make sense in, your, in the system that you're interested in? Maybe it would have, but I would have to, I have to tell you, I would have to look into that. Because what, what they're doing, they're reducing, right? We're, yeah, they're reducing. We're adding. Sure, sure. So, well, no. Uh, huh? you, you, uh, okay, I don't comment more. <laughs> I haven't done any research on this. Just. And what, what about uh, using um, um, spectral analysis of the solution to your system um, to figure out what are um, what are the components that's more important you can throw them away things like that mm -hmm. so we don't do it with spectral I mean we do the singular value decomposition right okay so we're kind of getting maybe that's one slide I should have had um, so when we get the, the simulational data um, from the very beginning of the slide, actually. Uh, let's move to the very beginning where we had... Uh, sorry, a lot of clicking. I should have been over there. So when we get some of these snapshots and we trace simulations, so we get these these flow fields, mm -hmm. yeah. what we do is we save them at every time step. Um, because time steps might be very small. It's vectorized, right? And then you compute a single value decomposition of all this data. And that's when you compress. So that's what tells you which of the modes to keep. But the SVD orders the modes by energy. So it looks at the singular value would tell you the kind of the energy decay, right, in, in, the, in the data. Um, you can also go after the frequency, if that's interesting. Right. Some of these right. combustion people, they're interested in, in keeping the first you know, mode that oscillates at right. 1600 hertz. You know, yes. That's the so, one so they care about. The ranges you might be interested in. in exactly. In so then you would have to go another way, but right. both of them is done. Actually, one of the methods I mentioned here is dynamic mode decomposition that goes purely after the frequency. Okay. So dynamic mode decomposition, both very well known for flows, POD in the 60s came out looking at energy, and dynamic mode decomposition came out probably five, ten years ago, and ten years ago actually now, and it said, well, we want to look at one mode, and I want to know that that mode oscillates at this frequency. Right. 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 And that's the way I do the decomposition. Both is okay. Um, I think we just have much more intuition with the energy-based framework. Yeah. Other questions? And I have a question. So in, in the examples you have shown, what's like typical computation time? Uh, minute, one hour, one night? For the full order or for yeah, the reduced? For, for reduced. 
Um, yeah, a few minutes, maybe, maybe a minute. I mean, ideally you want to have it seconds, but a reduced order model of this, when you need, I mean, these are computationally infeasible models, but if you need 300 modes, then you probably need a few. Um, this, this, this is just showing that some of the things fail, but uh, the problems I showed at the end, yeah, would be in seconds. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, and again, this goes back to the fact that if you do uncertainty quantification, you want to compute a statistic of a problem, of an output. Mm -hmm. And to compute a statistic, you need a thousand samples or 10,000 samples. So then you need 10,000 times one simulation. So that's why you want to keep these things a little bit under mm -hmm. typically a second, five seconds is kind of a good, good time. Depends on what you want to do. Really depends. Mm -hmm. and, and another question. So what you have this listening transformation, right? When you add new variables and extend the system, uh, is it is a new system exactly equivalent to the old system? So is there a projection between solutions? I mean, the system is exact. There's no, I mean, I didn't do, I mean, it has a bunch of auxiliary dynamics, but the original system is the, yeah. is the original state is the same. Yeah, but so, like... Or do you want to go to but, the... Can you go to the example of x, x to the fourth? Oh, the x to the fourth? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so when you apply a chain rule, uh -huh. right, so you keep these differential equations, uh -huh. but you kind of forget uh, equations with w1 is equal to x square, w2 is equal to w1 square. No, so, but these are encoded here, right? The same information is, is here, right? Yeah, that's, 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 that's my question. So are, are they equivalent? Yes? I mean, I... Maybe, I just... just uh, chain rule, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, ch ch chain rule, right? It's, it, it gives you from this to this, so it's implication. Right, right. And I'm asking whether it's equivalence. So if I know these differential equations, is it necessarily true that w1 is equal to x square, or actually there might be more solutions? He gives them anyway. No, 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 no. From the from the old. No, on, 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 the, on the left side, right? On the left side. So yeah, no, yeah, but that, no, that's an alternate way of writing. It doesn't mean that the left hand side implies the right hand side. That's your question, right? Yeah, my question. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my question. So I I don't mind if it doesn't. It just. <laughs> I mean, what I can tell you that x dot will always. I mean, that the solution of x will always be the same. And that's yes, the one I care yes. about. Yes. Ah, right? but but so so, I don't so, care about the. I mean, I so don't if, know. If, if w one is not x squared, it's just not not very important for you. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. That's that's fair. I I would think it is, but I I don't know exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But to me, all that matters, all I want to reduce is actually the original state. But I can't do it here because I might not have the right method to do it, but I can do it here because... Mm -hmm. Okay, good, yeah. good, fair enough. So, so W1 could be X and, uh, and then the, um, W2 could be W1Q. <laughs> um, because yeah, you what you want is yeah. W2 is X4, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so I mean, there is no... Well, I, I don't know whether... Then you have no. to choose another one to make it no. ready. But I don't know whether it'll be, that's true. Exactly. Yeah. So there's different, there are different auxiliary ways. variables to make to do that. That's why I said this is non this is non unique, right? So yeah. you would have just made the second system, right? But your x would right. still yeah. be the same x. Yeah, because, I mean that that's the reason why the system always can be reduced to quadratic because you just keep you can keep adding new right. variables. Yeah. Yeah. Which which um, are, for example they usually yeah. I mean, you start with just uh, monomials that are of high degree in your system. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, of course, you have functions like exponential to something, then, then of course, you can, that, that's different. And, yeah, but, but, uh, but because of the, uh, the way that the, the product rule goes, um, that's, what, that, that's probably the reason why it could be every system can, I mean, with elementary functions, as they mm -hmm. yeah. can, be, can be reduced yes. to the quadratic case. Whether whether the quad, can the, whether the quadratic case can be covered for real system that that's that is a, that's the reverse question yeah. Has anything been studied on that? I'm not aware of that. No, oh. I haven't. I haven't seen that. So, um, if it's not equivalent, then you really don't know that the solution of the reduced quadratic system or, or the quadratic not reduced but the quadratic system, the lifted system. Give you the same solution as the original system. No. Uh, ah, okay. No. no, no, no. All right. Because I'm going this because, way. Because the original system is there. All right. It's still, it's still there. It's yeah. not there. It's not. Okay, but it's there if 
he knows that w1 is x squared, otherwise he doesn't. Yeah, you need to store that w1 is x squared. You need to keep that. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe, yeah. Maybe, okay. maybe we don't okay. need, but that's the that's, that's, that's question. So, but yeah, maybe, maybe this should be just some written down carefully right, yeah, because yeah. maybe it's n yeah. now yeah. In, in the air we cannot resolve the issue. Even they claim that you, uh, in this example at least, you have to put it in. Ah, okay. I think William argued that it will. It's, well, it's certainly safer if you he, put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Not just that, but he thinks it's, you actually have to put it in. Uh -huh. Okay. He thinks, but no one has to check. But, it's, but, but if you way, put it in, in, in a way you have to integrate. In a way you have to integrate the left hand side. And so there are arbitrary things that you have to throw in when you integrate. Right. So how do you eliminate those to, to get back to that? to ensure that you have get a DAE. Well, that's an open I'm not sure that. And the, the reason you don't want to put that W1 is X squared because it's, it's no longer an OD form and you don't, it's too complicated. Is that the case? Uh, yes, right now I'm not. You don't want the, 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 the DAE reduction, yeah, is a, is a problem, yeah. Right. Anyways, I also prescribe, I mean, I'm also consistent with the initial conditions. I mean, that, that will right, initial, of course, of course, yeah, yeah, eliminate so, that. And, and any change the variables constant. require that. Okay, another question is, um, um, in the algorithm that you have, or rather, L algorithm, right. no, actually an algorithm, I suppose, from the, suppose you already lifted it to a quadratic system. Mm -hmm. So let's say you just give it the quadratic system, you don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. right? and do you have an algorithm to actually do a reduction, you say that, or know the conditions of your quadratic system, then you compute something, and then you say, okay, this one can be reduced, I know I can reduce it. And then do you know how much you can reduce it? And then one more question is, is there a maximum number of variables in your quadratic system where the method simply, I mean, with the current computational power, you can't do anything about it? Hmm. Um, I mean, that, that really depends on what the, your computational power is, but. Um, generally, quadratic systems reduction. Um, I mean, I, mean, I think you have to compute. An, you have to compute an SVD in a projection. So if you okay. can compute an SVD efficiently, as far as SVD, okay. that probably scales, you know, okay. order of n squared, uh, n log n, something like this. Then you can, if, if your machine can afford that, then okay. that's one part. Then you have your B, your subspace, and then you have to do a projection. Okay, but that's easier. Um, and your first part of the question was the. Well, was the first <laughs> oh, he doesn't remember that. I did. <laughs> if you can uh, reduce the QP system at all. Right, right. Is, is there any, so if you're given a quadratic system, right. is there some function of that coming from that system uh -huh. that you can draw, information that you can compute, uh -huh. and say that now I know that this system can be ah, okay. or okay. I can't. So you don't waste your time doing anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in general, you can always, I mean, that goes back to the question, what is... A reduced system, right? Well, you can most system you can reduce. You well, make you make large errors. Um, I mean, well, it's an well, approximation. Well, well, let's, let's don't even talk about the properties that you need to preserve. Okay. Just generally, so you start with a system, a nonlinear system with let's say n variables. Mm -hmm. Now you lift it to a quadratic system. Mm -hmm. You get an m variables. Right. Yeah. You reduce it. You get a k system. Right. Yeah. Now. Is there any way to tell me a priori that k can be less than n? Um, uh, that it is possible, at, at least. I think it's a different way of thinking. It's always possible. We, I mean, the, 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 yeah, I mean, you can So always... you mean any n system can be reduced in, by order, in, in, I mean, the number of variables? I mean, so reduce is not, reduce is never, when we speak of reduction, it's never accurate, right? It's no, never no, exact. I, it's never exact. You always, the moment you reduce, the uh, moment for us to go from n to n minus one, so you you, know you, you throw one mode you throw away, away things and the last right. mode is the last single value that you kind of like scales right, a little right, bit with right, the right. last. Always do an approximation. An approximation is you approximate this dynamic in a subspace. Okay, right. So you can say uh, you I, always I make, just, it. Uh, make a given determinant system that kind of reflects some property of the original system that will still be a reduction. Exactly. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any questions?
Alles, thanks to you again.